In this video I'll talk about random networks and compare them to the networks that represent real systems. When scientists first started to think about how real situations could be mapped onto networks, they compared the messy social networks like the one on the right with the regular uniform lattices that physicists and chemists were used to dealing with. Their first idea was to model the network on the right as a random network and try to use mathematical tools from probability theory to understand the properties of these random networks in the hope of shedding light on real ones. This turned out not to work, and we'll explore the reasons why, which tell us a lot about real networks. There are a number of algorithms for making a random network. The simplest one is as follows. Start with n nodes and no edges. Pick a number p between 0 and 1. This number p will control how many edges we end up having in our final network. For every pair of nodes, generate a random number and check it against p. If it's greater than p, connect that node pair with an edge, otherwise leave the nodes disconnected. After we've cycled through all the pairs, we have a random network with n nodes where each pair of nodes is connected with a probability p. This network is so common it has a special name, GNP, and is sometimes called an erdos rheny graph after the two mathematicians who studied it extensively. When the network is constructed, we don't know how many edges it has. However, the average number of links should be p times n times n minus 1 over 2. Pause and make sure you understand why. In practice, for reasonably large n, we have to check n squared possible edges, so this is not a very efficient algorithm, but fast versions exist that manage to construct the network in fewer steps. This is an example of a random network generated with 30 nodes and p equals 0.1. With such a low value of p, not enough edges are constructed to connect all the nodes in the network to each other. This is an example of a disconnected network. This is an example of a random network generated with 30 nodes and p equals 0.2. Now the network is connected. This is an example of one with 30 nodes and p equals 0.3. It's still connected with even more edges than before. The property of a random network that will be of interest to us is its degree distribution. Remember, this is a probability that a randomly selected node has k connections for any choice of k. To compute it, we need three terms. The first is the probability that a node has k connections. This is p to the power of k, the chance of k successful linkages. The second is the probability that the other linkages were failures. Since each node can link to n minus 1 other nodes, this means that n minus 1 minus k nodes have failed to link. Lastly, we have to account for the fact that we can choose k links from n minus 1 possibilities. This should remind you of something that we've already studied. The degree distribution of a random network is given by the binomial distribution. Pause here, get a piece of paper, draw some nodes and edges on it, and make sure you understand where each term in this formula comes from. It turns out that the binomial distribution can be very accurately approximated by this formula, which is called a Poisson distribution. The reason for using the approximation is that the formula is a bit simpler and the error is very, very small for a reasonably large n. This is an example of the degree distribution of a random network with 200 nodes and p equals 0.3, along with the corresponding Poisson distribution. You can see that the measured distribution and the approximation agree very well. We could do some more rigorous tests, for example the KS test, and it would likely show very good agreement between the theoretical and empirical distribution. It turns out that real networks are not random. Here are three examples taken from Barabasi's book, which is linked on the course webpage. Note that we're looking at the degree distributions now on a log-log plot. The first one shows the measured degree distribution of the network representation of the internet. Nodes are routers and links are internet connections. The second is a network of science collaboration, where the nodes are scientists and the links are co-authorships. That means two people are linked if they've written a paper together. The third is protein interactions. The nodes are proteins and the links are chemical binding interactions between them. These are three very diverse systems, and in all three, when we plot the measured degree distribution compared to the Poisson approximation, the solid line, we're way off. The measured distributions have much longer tails. That means we see far more very high degree nodes than the Poisson model predicts. For example, in the internet network, the Poisson model predicts basically a zero probability to observe nodes with degree greater than 100. Yet, we see many nodes with degree 100, or even 1000. Clearly, this model is not working. Figuring out why tells us something very important about real networks. While the degree distributions are not Poisson, they can be relatively well approximated by a straight line on these logarithmic axes. As we know, having a straight line on log axes implies the y variable, in this case the probability of having a node of degree k, is nonlinearly related to the x variable, in this case the degree k. This type of degree distribution is often called a scaling law, and networks which have this kind of degree distribution are also called scale-free. The parameter gamma is called a scaling exponent. 
Here is a very famous network representation of the internet, made by the Center for Applied Internet Data Analysis in California, who specialize in making visualizations of the internet. Here we can see two key features of a real scale-free network. The first, which is where the term scale-free comes from, is that if you zoom into any part of the network, it looks more or less the same as the zoomed out version. The network has a self-similar fractal structure. This is what scale-free means. There's a huge amount of mathematical theory about scale-free networks and processes coming from statistical physics and mathematics. I'll put some links in the resources if you're interested. The second property are hubs. I've highlighted a few. Real networks have hubs. These are nodes, which are much, much more highly connected than average. They are responsible for the long tails in the degree distribution. Though they are few in number, these high degree nodes are very influential on the network. For example, if we have a network where information is flowing, these hubs are important mediators and gatekeepers of information. If the network is modeling other flows like electricity or air traffic, then any faults at these hubs are much more significant than elsewhere. You can see in this example that random networks lack hubs. All the nodes are quite similar in terms of degree. This is expressed in the degree distribution by seeing that the Poisson distribution is both fairly narrow, constraining the likely values of k to be within a small range, and also symmetric, not allowing the long right-hand tail that we saw in real networks. Here's an example of the US domestic air carrier Continental's flight network. You can clearly see hubs in Newark, Cleveland, and Houston. So to get from A to B using only this carrier usually requires visiting one of these hubs. In practice, identifying hubs and networks is an important step in network analysis and tells us a lot about the network's ability to tolerate faults, cut connections, or even deliberate attacks.